Nobody knows about, except those who have been living this thing for the last few years. And it is one that has, that really led us to where we wound up. You know, more than, I don't know, more than any single incident, when you combine this last thing, the cocaine addiction thing, with everything else that had gone on, I don't know, for me, the cocaine addiction was bad enough, but the cumulative effect of that combined with all the other stuff was just, it, it had left me drained. And I told people this, you know, it's not something that we really could have ever gotten into because, number one, to do it all, it would have taken all day. I mean, it's one of those things we could have talked about all day. Probably a lot longer than that. Yeah. I mean, it was just so big and just such a dominant part of the backdrop of what we've been doing for the last few years that that it's it would have just been overwhelming. Well, I figured it would come out some way, someday. And it pretty much did in this week's Dallas Observer. Richie Whit wrote a story that is in this week's edition that details, or at least in greater detail than ever has been before, the things that went on that led to that. Um, the Hammer sat still for this, and he sat still for a pretty long time, and Richie interviewed him. And um, he talked to me. And there are a number of other more tertiary characters involved, but mostly this story involves me and, by proxy, you boys and him. And there are a few points that we would like to touch on. Now, for those who have read the story already, you'll get this. Those of you who have not, you may not, but you'll hear us talk about it and it will kick in when you read it. True. Um, first of all, there are a number of inaccuracies, further inaccuracies in the story. Um, the unfortunate thing about this is that the Hammer has always had only a fleeting acquaintance with the truth. I mean, the guy just is a very troubled soul who has a difficult time telling anybody the truth about a lot of things. And I know that was the thing that bothered you more than any other thing, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I got a million friends. I got tons of friends, and I've kept my friends, and I keep in touch with my friends. And I cherish my friends. I mean, no lie. You guys know. I, I mean, you make fun of me for having so many friends. You know? I mean, that's yeah. kind of the bit. And, yeah. the. But I also respect that. Yeah. Because I know you do stay in touch with them. Yeah. And, and I know how good a friend you are to them. And with the Grego situation, you know, it got to a point. And, yeah, that last, the cocaine thing was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, for he and I, and it's referenced in the article that, that I turned my back on him. And he can't believe that I turned my back on him. That, you know, we had a really close relationship. Which, for the show, I mean, there's no question that, that um, you know, I was his closest friend on the show. It was just, it was just the way it was, you know. He would tell me things that it was bothering him, and that was fine. You know, no big deal. And, and yeah, we did have a good relationship. But, you know, once you start dealing with people who have a, a problem lying that are pathological liars and it gets to a point where you look someone in the face four different times and you confront them on their demons and this was the late this was the the last straw was the cocaine thing and I you know over a course of two months I approached him personally four times I said Grego are you doing cocaine just shoot me straight. 
You know, I've been around it enough to see people that are on it, and I, you know, I know. No, I'm not. I'm, where, why are you saying that? You know, a couple weeks later, the same thing. A couple weeks later, the same thing. All the while, vehemently denying anything. And the last occasion, and this is really the last good conversation I had with a guy, was the day that he showed up late for work. When he showed up at 3.30 at our remote. When, the last day. The last day. When I was calling Dan Bennett on, our, on my way to work saying, I got a really bad feeling about this. Somebody needs to go to his apartment. Which they did, you know. We, we had the people at his building open up his apartment to make sure he wasn't in there. And because I had a feeling that bad things were going on. And after, which is written in the article too, he skipped out on a drug test that the station told him to go take after he was late to work that day and left mm -hmm. the show. He skipped out on the drug test. I called him immediately after we got off the air, and, and I asked him again, Why, what are you doing? Please tell me. Just come clean that you're doing this. You know? No, Corby, I, I'm not, I swear to you, I'm not. I am not. I would not lie to you about this. I am not. On and on and on. I go, Grego, please, don't do this. Corby, I would not lie to you. I would not lie to you. Hmm. <laughs> And two days later, he comes clean in our boss's office, saying that, you know, he's had this addiction problem for months and months. And I was to the point then in our relationship, and again, there had been several more, I mean, too many to count, really bad lying incidents, that I just didn't want to deal with it anymore, you know? I'd had enough. It drains you, man. And it, it had come to the point where he was putting us in jeopardy. You know, and putting us in jeopardy means he's putting my family in jeopardy. And it was time to let go. Yeah. It was absolutely time to let go and let him get on with his life and figure out a way to clean himself up. And for his accusation that I turned on him, I've never turned on one friend of mine in my life and I didn't turn on him it was just time to let go and he, you know he says I never called him no I didn't because I didn't know what to say Man, Man, I, I, I gotta tell hey, you I didn't either being being his closest friend on the show I also had that much more to lose and man I was really really pissed and hurt and you, you guys know it as well as anybody and my friends do too. And my family does too. I was so pissed. And still am. You know, I am still pissed over this situation. Yeah, I am too. And I, hope I am too. And I haven't called him either for that very reason. Number one, I don't think I'm really very much top of the pops with him these days anyway. And I doubt that he would much want to hear from me. But moreover, I got nothing to say to him, man. I got nothing to say to him because I still am just really, really pissed by this whole thing. And I hope there comes a day when when I'll think differently about him. You know, I mean, I realize what we had. I do. And what we had means a lot to me. I mean, I realize that back there down the road over my shoulder is all the great radio that he and I did together. And the great thing that we had together and the great team that we were. And yeah, that means everything to me. But you know what? That went away over time. And, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I value all that. But like you say, that was then. This is now. And when it's time to move on, it's time to move on. And, you know, one of his quotes in there to Richie in the Observer article was, you know, I was basically, I, I don't know, that you, you may have it up there. I don't know what it was exactly. Well, I don't have a copy of it in front of me. But, and Danny, you may know it too. He's talking about how he wasn't hurting anybody but himself. Which is completely untrue. Oh, my God. It couldn't be any further from the truth. He doesn't, does he not realize how every single one of us on this show took this home with us every day? Every day to for our months. families, yeah. To, to our personal lives, how this aided us. Worrying about what the hell is going to happen to him? Yeah. Is, is he going to... Is him showing up or not showing up for a show, which you just don't do. I mean, <laughs> if, if, you're on, if you're on the air 
and you don't show up for a show, or and don't call, you are dead. I got to tell you, know you what man. I'm saying? And that the first thing that comes to your mind is this yes. person is either dead or in the hospital or in some serious trouble. There's and no that's, question. That crossed our mind all the times because we knew what he was doing. I mean, there was no question, but. If he wasn't willing to admit it, there was nothing that we could do. No. And, and a man that's 40-something, in his late 40s, with the, the weight condition that he had, doing blow all the time, you are concerned for that guy's heart. You don't know if that guy's going to live or die. So, yes, we, it, it did affect people other than, than, than him. Yeah, I mean, it affected me every single day. It and not affected only... Mike, it affected you, Danny. I mean, and, you know, we're the four, including Grego, we lived with it every day for a long time. And it's a not long, only long time. Not only just worrying about his health and his livelihood, but also what he chose to do affected us as far yeah, as it affected our, the show, our it careers. The show down, man. If this had kept going on, the detachment from him, and and you saw the show just start spiraling and the ratings going down. I mean, we could have gotten fired. There wouldn't be, there wouldn't have been a thing we could have done about it. Nothing. No. Not one thing. All right. When we come back, there is one thing he said where this is something that he seems absolutely convinced of, and I'm here to tell you today, and I will swear to this on anything or anybody that I have, that it is not so. We'll get to that next. KTCK Dallas-Fort Worth, KTTK Sanger. KTLA. Right now we're bringing the room down a little bit, discussing the Dallas Observer article about... The hammer and his departure from the presentation. Can I just say one more thing before you get into what I know you're going to get into? Mm -hmm. I declined comment for this article. And I've got a ton of emails just blasting me. What, why are you, what are you hiding from? Why didn't you talk? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't talk because the only thing that would have come out of my mouth to Richie was negative. Which to me, would have absolutely buried Greg. And wasn't enough already out? I mean, everybody knew what had happened to the guy. What am I going to say that's, that's going to add any clarity to the story? I mean, I could probably give you some tidbits here and there as far as, you know, stuff that was going on over the past couple of years and within the show. But, you know, my whole thing was I knew you were going to talk. And whatever you said... I was going to agree with because we lived the same thing. We've been going through the same thing. I mean, I just I did the same thing, Corby. There was nothing that I could say. And people, why didn't you talk? It looks so bad. You not talking? Well, dude, I didn't want to bury the guy. As a friend, I didn't feel the need to do that. I mean, that's that's what I said too. When R and Richie he put a thing on the uh, the Observer webpage, like answering a lot of P1 questions and stuff, and that was one of the things. And he mentioned that you flat out you re didn't return any of his calls. I replied by email saying that, hey, I'm, whatever Mike says, we all live the same stuff, so there's no reason for me to say anything. I'm just going to stand by whatever he says. Because, okay, so I add something to it, and what am I going to say? I'm going to talk about the, the third pre-show meeting nosebleed as opposed to the, the, the pre-show nosebleed one that Mike's talking about. It's yeah. just it's superfluous at some point, and it's unnecessary. You know, throughout the whole thing, well, you know what, just, just let it be known that... I. I didn't feel the need to talk because, if you want to put it this way, I wanted to protect the guy. And that bit me in the ass. I mean, right. that bit me in the ass hard. Well, let me illuminate on why I did do it. Because I had a, I had a very strong feeling, and I know you boys did too, that this was going to turn out the way it did. And everybody should see this for what it is. He is doing nothing more here than trying to get attention and trying to make people feel sorry for him. We've been around the guy for 14 years. We have seen it over and over again. That's what he does. That's what he's doing here. Now, if you want to give him that attention and you want to feel sorry for him, fine, go ahead. I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to, but everybody should know that that's his shtick. That's what he does. That is what he's doing here. And I knew he was going to do that. Our side of this story needed to be told. So that's why I did. Now, I'm glad you did. And, you know, and, I, and we're not going to say anything about any of this stuff. But, man, that thing just scratched the surface on what's been oh, going yeah. on. Oh, yeah. I mean, I there mean, is, <laughs> that is a thumbnail of what has happened over the last few years. Put it this way. If somebody else 
wants to do something on this story, which by now, by the way, is about nine months old. Yeah. You could have a baby in the time since he's been gone from the show. It's, you know, it's a very old story. It's very old news. And believe me, before this came up this week, I'd moved on and now I've been pulled back into it again. But, but you know, if somebody else wants to do something on this and they came to me and said, look, give me some stuff that you didn't give Richie, I got it for sure. Yeah. You do too. Yeah. All right, now let's get into this other thing because I want to get back to you and the beating you've been taking on this thing. You took a be- you've been taking a beating partly because you didn't talk. Yep. And you've also been taking a beating because people seem to think that you somehow, um, you somehow have been opportunistic in this, that you have somehow finagled wrongfully your way into the position you now occupy. And, well, j- let's just get into what he says here. Um, Richie writes, according to both, the Corby conundrum, conundrum deepened their chasm. Sensing the show needed a tune-up in 99, Reiner suggested bringing in a third, po- a third voice. Williams pushed for Corby Davidson, who has lost his foothold at the station in the wake of the Chris Arnold show going kaput. And I said, when Grego first mentioned him, I didn't know him. Then when I met him, I couldn't stand him, but eventually he was right. It worked. That's true. Yep. I mean, when he first brought up this idea, I was against it. But I, I distinctly remember this one day. We were sitting in there discussing it. He brought it up again, and I just looked at him and said, no. <laughs> and he, lo- he, he said, Reins, we may not have any other option." And as I thought about it after that, I kind of softened on the idea and said, okay, we'll give it a try. We'll give it a shot. Isn't that good to know you were the last option, Corby? No, I kind of knew that at the time. <laughs> I'm sure you did. It was very little secret. Um, anyway, he, write, he goes on. Of all the sensitive issues between them, from women to drugs to habitual lying, none is more polarizing than Davidson. What a... An adjective frequently used concerning you. What a load of crap. In short, Williams believes Reiner steered conversations toward Corby and away from him in an effort to reroute the show's flowchart. Reiner calls it jealousy. Grego says, he orchestrated a game of freeze-out against me. It was like keep-away between him and Corby and Danny. For whatever reason, I wasn't utilized like I once was. I still don't know why. All right, first of all, that implies that there was some formulated, formalized plan. There was some sort of discussion where you and I got together yeah, and said, let's freeze out the hammer. And believe me when I tell you, I will swear to this on anything or anyone I have, my young daughter, my mother, whomever, whatever you want, the great game of baseball... Wow. My title is Baseball Jesus, whatever. Mm-hmm. That never happened. Nothing like that ever happened. It was never talked about. It was never broached. It, nothing. There was no insinuation of a meeting. No, nothing. No. I mean, if I, if I wanted to do something like that, first of all, I would probably have that conversation with him. You know? But I, I, I wasn't about to do anything like that. The show had always been him and me. And whoever else we surrounded ourselves with at the time. And that's the way I saw it. That's the way I wanted it to stay. But I began having these visits with him after the show started about how you need to involve me in the show more. You know, you're going to Corby with everything. You're not going to me. And I can't tell you how blindsided I was the first time that happened. Oh, he came to me too. You know, what's going on? What are you all doing? I'm like, man, what are you talking about? Talk, talk, your microphone is sitting right there. Yes, talk. It's on. Talk. All I'm trying to do is have a good show however I best can. I, now, I'll tell you what, Mike, the opposite happened. Because I can tell you numerous occasions where we would see him laying out on segments and direct questions 
to Grego specifically to include him into the show yeah, because yeah, we felt like he was laying out. out. And right. He, and he was having such a pity party at the time that he wouldn't, he would just be like, oh, whatever. And then I, I remember going into Danny a thousand times going, dude, what is happening? He won't talk. He will not talk. What are we going to do? I mean, this guy is very important to the success of this show. And that's another thing, man. This is our freaking livelihood. And to see it spiraling out of control, to say that we weren't concerned is a massive understatement. Everyone was freaking out over it. But no, there was never any kind of plan or anything like that. Now, I will say this. When you work somebody new into the show, then, yeah, you're probably going to pay a little bit more attention to them because I wanted to see what kind of chemistry you were going to have on the show. I wanted you to find your place. I wanted to accelerate that process a little bit. I wanted you to develop chemistry with me and with him and with all the rest of us and just see where that was all going to wind up. And so, I don't know, maybe, maybe I made it a point to talk to you, but if I did, that was always conscious. But this is four years down the road. Yes, I mean, I've been I on know, this show now for nine years. I know that. I know that. And, and, you know, that was very early on, and we didn't start having those conversations until the chemistry was well established. Yeah. You know? But there was never any kind of plan. Now, as time went on, though, and we all saw what was going on, and we all started to feel, look... I don't know what's going on here. I don't know where he's at. Because there were some days when we would be in there and he would do nothing except sit over there and pout all day and just not say a word. He'd sit there with his arms folded like this. And, and you really had to drag stuff out of him then. And you know what? Looking back on it, what I should have done then is just tell him, look, man, go home. If you're not feeling it today, just go home. Because that just brought everybody down. Yeah, it did. It was a massive wet blanket on everybody up here. And then, you know, inevitably, once every other week, you would get called into a meeting with him and the bosses and whoever else, and that question would be broached again. And this went on and on and on with all of us. And over time, we began to, I think, get the sense that there was something going on here. We didn't know if we were going to be able to reverse it. We didn't know if we were going to be able to fix it, but we did know this. We still have a job to do, and however we best can, we better do it. And if that means working you in more, and I turn more attention to you on things, and you become a bigger part of things than otherwise, and because for whatever reason he didn't want to be, then so be it. I mean, we just, but, but there was never any kind of discussion along those lines either. No. That happened organically. Yeah. There's four hours to fill. Yes. Of talking. Right. And we had to fill those hours as best we could, and through the process of all this, over time, we started to see that, that it might be best filled another way than the way it previously had been. Yeah. It's well put. All right, it is 531. We'll come back and have some more thoughts on it. And um, good times with them. All right, it is girls' night out out here at Duke's, and I know we brought the room way down with all this, and I know we got a party and everything, and we're going to party, and we're going to have some fun and some yucks and get the round tables up and running and all that. But um, let's just wrap this up here with whatever you boys might have further to add. I've talked enough. No. I mean, anything else I have to say is in the story. Um, I mean, whatever other points you want to address. Can I say something to speak to what Corby was talking about earlier about the whole friendship thing and turning your back? Yeah. And this may be redundant, but it gets to a point, and we're talking about Grego and the lying, and man, to me, the cocaine thing, I, yeah, it affected us, but like you said, it was, it was mostly about not having, having a friend in your life that was not 100% honest, and more often than not, was 100% lying about something. We had, to, we had to come in to work every day, or live our lives every day with him, not knowing if he was... It, whatever he was telling us was the truth. Yeah, I mean, every time that the guy said anything, it got to the point with me, especially after the 
thumb stomach thing, which is detailed in the article, where you, I just, I just wound up asking myself after everything he said, okay, can I believe this? Do I believe it? And you can't have a relationship, a true, honest friendship with somebody like that. No, you can't. And when Corby, man, you are the, one of the most loyal friends that I've ever had. So for people to say that you turned your back on him is just, it disgusts me. Yeah, because it, I, I saw you more often, I mean so many times, asking him point blank to his face, offering his help. Man, do you have a problem? Are you on coke? Is there anything I can do? What's going on? Please talk to me, Grego. And it gets to the point where, and I, and I mentioned this yesterday when I read this email that I sent to a listener. Even in an intervention, and you guys watch that show, yeah. you have family members that have kids or brothers or husbands or wives that they've known their entire lives that are willing to go into this room and say, look, if you don't get honest and get real and get help, we are willing to not speak to you again. This is what happened with a man that we worked with that had a working relationship with for nine years. So yep. don't make it sound like we turned our backs on him. We did everything that we could. And he copped to what he got caught in. And nothing more. Right. I mean, everything he says in the story is stuff that, that we all already knew. Now, now, do I wish bad things on him? No. I love Grego. I want him to get, be healthy. I want him to find employment. I want him back on the air because that's what he's good at. I want all of those things for him. But as far as him being someone that I consider a close friend that I can trust, it's just not there. And I have few close friends in my life. And the ones that I do have, I really feel like I could tell them anything. And that when they tell me something, that I, I feel like they're telling me that God's honest 100% truth. And that's what a friendship is. This was not, this ultimately became not a friendship. I think I put a little bit more credence and the drug aspect of this thing troubles me a little bit more than it does you boys uh -huh. for this reason. There were many times over, year, over the years, especially after the Vicodin thing, if indeed that's what that was, where... Grego would reference his addictive personality. I mean, he would talk about it. He would say, I've got one. I know it. And I thought, you know, well, good. At least he's aware of this, and this will keep him from uh, out of harm's way when it comes to stuff like that. Well, this cocaine thing was a conscious choice that yeah. he made. You know, I mean, he knew he had an addictive personality. He knew what could happen if he so much as just tried it on a lark one night. And yet he thought so little of what we do and what we had and us and the radio station and everybody else around him that he went ahead and did it anyway. And the thing that could happen, the worst thing that could happen, did. The next thing he knew, he was doing it all the time and coming up there sweating and shaking and jumpy and fidgety and making goofy noises and bleeding. Bleeding. I mean, at work, man. You know, it's one thing to do stuff like that in your own private time, but... On the weekends. When you're mixing it in at work like at, that. At fight night. Yeah, man, there's another just, one. It's just... And All man, this it, it is became, documented. It became absolutely overwhelming. The whole situation. And, and the worst part about it was, is, you know, the, the moments leading up to it. I'm talking about last summer about this time when we were, when we had an idea it was going on, but weren't really sure. You know, those, those five months leading up to October were awful. They were awful on the air. We prayed. I mean, we talked about this between, amongst the three of us. Man, I hope no one is noticing how bad the show is and how bad he is, mm -hmm. how bad off he is. Mm -hmm. And how disengaged he is. I, I mean, we were praying that no one noticed. And you know what? We were lucky enough that, that very few people did. Now, some of the astute listeners, they took notice. And they would send us emails. What's going on? What's the deal? What's wrong with him? And we would just brush it off. Eyes, you know, you figure it out. No big deal. But then, you know, it all comes to a head there in mid-October. And he's gone. And damn it, if the next three months weren't just as bad or worse because we couldn't say anything and then 
you know, the legal aspects of it all. He got lawyered up. And, you know, that's another thing in that article that I wanted to talk about is, is he said he got ambushed by the station. There was a big meeting. Richie mentions it, that there was a really big meeting amongst all the on-air staff and Greg after he got out of rehab. Mm -hmm. And he says he was ambushed in there by all of us because we all aired whatever we'd been feeling about that guy for a long time. And he was not ambushed because I sent him an email the day before telling him exactly what was going to happen and to be ready for it because I didn't want him ambushed you know I prepare I, I thought I was preparing him for that he certainly wasn't ambush he had time to think about that and prepare himself for that and I don't know if there is any preparation you can do but he certainly wasn't ambushed under the technical term and that meeting well, in his mind he was or at least that's what he told Richie yeah and that meeting and was, again uh, what does that tell you exactly and that meeting was very tense and like you said in the article, it's it's the worst thing that probably any of us have ever gone through up here at the station, hands down. I can only think of one thing that even begins to rival it, and I'm not telling what that is. But I, but you know, the, the the fact that people think that I or you or Danny or Craig or George or Bob or Dan or Donovan or Gordon or any of these people turn their backs on him. Man, you just don't understand. And if you've been in a situation like that before with someone, then you do understand. But the last thing we wanted to do, you know, two years ago, I mean, or three years ago, I, can't ima I couldn't imagine the scenario playing out the way it did. Nobody wanted that to happen. No. Nobody did. No. This was everybody's worst freaking nightmare. Like I said, man, this is everyone's job. This is our livelihood. The show is very successful, was very successful too. And the thought of rocking that boat at all freaked us all out. You know, we're comfortable with it now, but that was, you know, I, I'm sure you were the same way. I mean, I lost many a night of sleep over thinking about this thing. And where it was headed I, and what was going on. And well, this yeah, I, I mean, I didn't like it, but wherever it was headed, I just wanted it to get there. I'm, that's kind of where I wound up after a certain point. I just wanted to get it going again, get it going in whatever direction it was going to go in, with him, without him, with you, with whomever else we were going to add, whatever the case may be. I just wanted to get it going again, get it headed in the right direction, get the ship right, and see what we could do then. Yeah. That's the main thing I wanted. But as far as, you know, turning your back on him goes, look, nobody, if anybody turned their back on him, it's because he brought this on himself. He turned his back yeah, on us. Yeah, if anybody, that is, that right, is the, right. in a nutshell, he turned his back on yes, us. If anybody, if any backs were turned on this, it was him. It was by him, on us, by him, on his job, by him on the show, by him on the radio station. You know, that's... That's it. That's just the way it came down. There's no scapegoats out there. It was all his decision. I never hung out with him once and encouraged him to do drugs. No. No, nor did I. Hell no. I mean, I thought he was the last guy that would ever get involved in something like that for a lot of reasons. Number one, he, he always just seemed very vehemently against it. And number two... He told us he had an addictive personality. Yeah. I mean, those are two real good reasons why I just never really worried about anything like this happening with him. And it's pretty damn awkward, or it had to have been tough for him. I can't speak for him, but it had to be really weird, you know, talking about steroids and the guys doing pot and, and other guys that had coke addiction all, all the while you know, rattling through his head, he knew what was going on in yeah. his own world. Yeah. I mean, it had to be horrible. It had to be a terrible experience. Yeah. Now, I know back in the 80s, he may have had some hooty times, a little bit more so than might be portrayed in the story, but, you know, that was then. We all did. Sure. And, you know, I didn't hold that against him. I mean, as far as I was concerned, that was then. This was was now. I didn't see, I didn't see anything that, you know, that made him think that. Yeah, that made me think he would be doing that. Shut up, you idiot! Is Doyle King out there? No, Doyle King starter kids out there. God, what a <laughs> ass out of here <laughs> of trash! All right, it is five fifty-two. This is Sports Radio thirteen ten. The ticket. It is.